Okay, welcome back, and we're just coming up to 11 a.m. here, and uh, we're going to give thanks to God for this Remembrance Day, but before we do that, because we've got a couple of minutes, just want to say hello, Ben. Hi, Tony. Great to doing? see you. Good to see you, too. Good to and, be here this morning. Yeah, we, we are looking forward to hearing the Word of God. As you know, we're doing a series on um, heroes of faith, and a little bird has told me you're, you're going to be speaking about Elisha. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Well, Ben, you, you look like Elisha, actually. <laughs> I'll be honest. You know, <laughs> yeah, you look like the prophet. You look, <laughs> you look like the, the man for the job today. So we're going to pray for, for Ben, and uh, we, we're excited for the word he's going to share. Then we're going to do a Remembrance Day prayer. Then I'm going to hand over to you. Is, are you. Are you good with that? Yeah, great with that. Great. Thank okay. You. So let's pray for Ben. Uh, before he shares, then we'll do our, mm. our little act of remembrance. Father, we just want to thank you for the word of God that's going out each week from LifeSpring Center to the nations of the world. We bless you for the power of your word, and we pray your anointing and grace to be upon Ben today as he shares your word. Oh, Father, Holy Spirit, let it come with impact and freshness and power in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So we're going to uh, just say thanks to God for his faithfulness and goodness in preserving our liberty as a nation and as the free nations of the world. Uh, we, we give thanks to God for that. You know, my own father... Uh, fought in the Second World War. He was a prisoner of war for three years in the Far East, and I remember all the stories. Um, he was on the beaches of Dunkirk, um, uh, like you know, tens of thousands of others. And so it's it's very real to me, you know, the the sacrifice that was paid for the freedom that we enjoy. And uh, you know, even when you look at the politics of today. Uh, just we've just had elections in America, and we we can look at that and think, oh my gosh, the nation is so divided, politics is so polarized. But let's look at it this way: that's the nature of democracy. Thank God that we have a democracy right there and right here. We have the ability to have different views, to hold those views openly. We're not in a di dictatorship. We're we're not in a, a, an, an autocratic nation. And so we thank God for those things. We're going to pray right now and give thanks to God on this Remembrance Day. Heavenly Father, we, we want to thank you for the freedom we enjoy as a nation. We bless you. We don't take it for granted. We don't take it lightly. We pray you will preserve that freedom in our nation from tyranny of any kind, whether it's left wing, right wing, or any other wing. We pray, Father, for the freedom for the gospel to be preached. We pray for freedom for men and women to speak uh, their conscience. We pray, Father, for freedom of speech in our nation. Freedom to practice our faith. And we pray, thanking you for all those who sacrificed uh, for the freedom that we enjoy today. Long may it live, Lord, and long may the gospel flourish in our nation. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. So God bless you, and uh, Ben, thank you. Over to you, my friend. Thank you, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, my name's Ben. I'm a, a member of um, LifeSpring Church here. Um, I have, uh, and I live with four women. Um, one of them is my wife, and the other three are my daughters, so keep the stream on. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about Elisha, and we're going to have a bit of a meander through uh, parts of Elisha's life, and hopefully show you a few things that you've, you've not seen before. Um, but I'm going to start with um, Elijah and the handover, uh, and I'm going to read from 1 Kings 19.3, and, and the context of this is um, Jezebel has killed all the prophets, um, and the only one left is Elijah, and he's escaped, but, but all is not well. He's done, he's tired, he's, he, he's at the end of his tether, and it says this, he was afraid 
uh, 1 Kings 19.3, Elijah was afraid and he, he ran for his life and he came to Bathsheba in Judah. He left his servant there. That gives us an indication of something. He had his servant with him and he left his servant there because his, he felt his mission was done. It was too much for him. He was tired. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush and he sat down under it and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. I've had enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around, and there by his head was some baked bread over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate, and he drank, and then he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, and he ate, and he drank, and he was strengthened by that food. And he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave um, and spent the night. We come onto this scene with Elijah being tired, being done, being worn out, ready to give it all up, ready to give in, ready to die. You know, he went into this deserted place with no provisions, nothing, no servant, no food, no water, no tools, zero. It felt like he was the end of his tether. It's no small thing to feel like that to feel like you're in a barren, difficult place, to leave the things that once got you excited, to leave the things that you thought were going to go one way and they didn't. His friends, colleagues, the prophets, all gone. The promises that he thought were over the lives of those friends, those prophets and him, all gone, or so he thought. So I wouldn't say he's going to grieve. He's actually going to sulk. You know, there's a time for grieving. There's a time to grieve. And with grieving, there's always an end point to bring you to that place of resurrection life, to bring you to that place of joy. But there is no time in the kingdom for sulking. And isn't it interesting that he gets under this bush in this kind of sulky way, he curls up and he's going to die. But in the Bible, it said, all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up. God doesn't give us that time to sulk and feel sorry for ourselves. He doesn't do that. That's not the father we serve. An angel of the Lord comes in and wakes him up and says, come on, there's a calling over your life. Wake up, get up. He's in a, a barren land, a desert land. He's in a place where not much is growing at all, where no crops are being farmed. And yet by his side is water. That's no small thing. Water in a desert, you know, it's possible to be in a barren place, to look down at your feet and see barrenness, to look around and think the environment, it shouldn't be producing anything. But God has produced for me water which brings life. He is the wellspring of life. And then I look to the right side and I see these hot coals, the thing that ignites my passion. I see this bread that's being cooked that's about working the ground and, and grain and nourishment. I see a Jesus, a Christ, who is there in the barrenness of life, who brings life to us, who brings uh, warmth to our faces, that brings flesh on our bones, that puts breath in our lungs, that nourishes us and brings us back to life. So Elijah gets up. It's twice that he's woken up by this angel, twice that he feeds and he eats something and he goes on and he's fed again. And then he's told about this, uh, the successes that have kind of come after him. God gives him a vision, a mission and a reason. And he has one for you this morning, a vision, a mission and a reason. And it's in Christ. But he says this in 1 Kings 19, the angel of the Lord says, go back to the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. That's really fascinating, isn't it? Go back the way you came. He's sending him back to a place where he would associate with death, with giving up, because he doesn't want anything wasted in Elijah's life. He wants Elijah to go back on that journey and to face the very thing that, that, that made him think, I can't do it. 
He wants him to overcome that place, to see it differently. And you know, when we have heaven's viewpoint on things, suddenly everything changes. Suddenly that barren land, what we see is something that can flourish and bring life. Suddenly we see a situation that once was death and when we walk into it, we produce life because of what is in us. And that was about him facing his fears. Remember, right at the beginning, it said Elijah was afraid. Well, he's sending him back to a place, not full of fear, but fearless. And that perfect love that casts out all fear. And then he gives him this commission. And he says this, uh, when you get to Damascus, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Let's remember that, I'll come back to that. And also anoint Jehu, son of Nishmi, um, anoint him as king over Israel and anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat from Abel in Manoah to succeed you as a prophet. Now, what we're going to know about this story is if you follow that all the way through, what we realize later on when we get into two kings and, and further on and into Chronicles is actually Elijah only fulfilled one third of that mission. One third. He passed the mantle on to Elisha. He anointed Elisha as prophet. He never got to do that with the kings. And when I look at the order of this, the angel of the Lord tells him to anoint the kings and then the prophet in that order. But he doesn't do it. He anoints the prophet first and he never gets to anoint the kings. And I'm thinking, well, why is that? That seems really strange to me. Surely you'd get the top of the tree, wouldn't you? You'd get the movers and the shakers in position. Um, in my work, I work a lot in colleges and um, on leadership teams. I have a, have a new job, which is fantastic, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, through my time in colleges, what I know is the principal or the head of that particular college and that organization, they're the ones that set the tone. They're the ones that set the culture of the organization. So surely, surely you'd get the kings in place first, anoint them, get them ready. But he doesn't. Why doesn't he do that? Surely you go for the top of the tree. You go for the greatest position of influence. Well, Elijah had lots of experiences of good kings and mainly bad kings after bad kings. He'd experienced about 80 years of war. Um, but it wasn't because of that. It's because actually the main influencer are the prophetic people. That's where the influence sits. And God looks at us, the church, and he wants to see us, that prophetic people, people that speak words of influence, words into situations, and bring change, bring redemption, bring love, bring hope into situation. That's what influence is. I used to be quite, uh, I used to get stuck on thinking, well, it's, the, those in the position of power that have the influence. No, it isn't. It's those with the word of God in them, with Christ in them that have the influence. And because of the outworking of that influence, their positions change. The environment changes around them. And then they provide that kingdom reality, that heaven on earth. Only a third of what he was commissioned to do did he see in his lifetime. The rest gets passed to Elisha. And that's just a little bit of a sketch of where we're at. Now, lots of other things happen, but we're going to look now just at the call of Elisha. So the first thing he does is he goes and uh, goes to commission Elisha as prophet. So Elijah went from there and he found Elisha, son of Shaphat, and he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. And he himself was driving the 12th pair. So Elijah went up to him and he threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come to you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and he gave it to the people and they ate and then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Let's just slow this down now. So we find Elisha, this man of no renown. A couple of weeks ago, 
we learn about Rahab and that suddenly we find her in the lineage of Christ. We don't find that with Elisha. We don't really know who he is. We know he's a laborer with his shoulder to the plow, hands of dirt and grit and toil. We know that. We know he would have been brought up farming so he would understand the seasons and the rhythms of life. We know he'd understand about sowing and reaping, success and failure, what it is to be full, what it is to be hungry, what it is to lose, what it is to win. He'd know those things. He'd know what it was to be content and know what it was to be wanting. And we see him framed with these 12 oxen. 12 is normally the uh, number for for government in, uh, in the word. And interestingly, there were two oxen. There were pairs of oxen, which makes 24. And we'll learn later that he gets this double portion. But he's this man that is working in the field with his head down, toiling, driving the cattle, day in, day out. And on the horizon, he sees this prophet arriving. On the horizon, as small as a dot, his destiny is awaiting in the mundane. You know, don't hate the mundane, the day-to-day. God chose him because he was a diligent man, because he worked hard, because he was full of compassion, because he was a man of faith. He was a man after God's own heart, and we'll see that. We know that he was potentially quite wealthy because having 12 oxen, there would have been a lot of land there. But again, his lineage is nothing to speak of. He wasn't academic. He wasn't particularly literate. He wouldn't have had a range of basic skills. He would have unlikely have traveled that far. He wasn't bred specifically to be in the king's courts. He wasn't prepared for that. He wasn't skilled in the arts of democracy and war and, uh, and law. He probably wasn't schooled in lots of the oral traditions of the time, of reading or writing or strategy or government. And he definitely wasn't part of a company of prophets. So who on earth was this guy? Well, it's simple. He was chosen. That's what qualified him. He was chosen. And do you know, Jesus Christ chose you, chose me. We're chosen. That's what qualifies us. Not a certificate that we hand in our, hang in our office. Not the experiences that we've had. The very fact that it is Christ and Christ alone and his grace, that's what qualifies us. You're chosen this morning. You're chosen. And it might seem that maybe your head is down in the mundane, that you're doing the things day in and day out and day in and day out. And I want you to know this morning that actually your destiny is not just on the horizon. It is running to meet you. It is running to meet you. There is nothing wasted in the plans of God for your life. Nothing at all. Because Elijah comes up to him and he puts a cloak over him or a mantle. Now this cloak, there's a this is an ancient custom. This isn't just a random cloak that he's that he's put on to to symbolize something. It means a lot more than that. When somebody would put a cloak over someone, it was usually an adult over a child, it was a symbol of adoption. Not a servant relationship, a father-son, a father-daughter relationship, a symbol of adoption. It was one of the ways that that an adult would adopt a child to their house. Isn't that amazing? That suddenly there's a season now that's going to change for this man. Things are never going to be the same again. In Ephesians, it says this, in Ephesians 1, 5, that God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That's what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. God is pleased with you this morning. He is pleased with you this morning. He's adopted you into his family. He's put that cloak of acceptance over you, ready. The question is, are you ready for that? Let's see what Elijah does next. (laughs) He's a bit baffled. It kind of comes out of nowhere, this heavy weight on him, and he looks round, and he sees this prophet, and he knows what it means. But he's probably not a boy. He's probably a man. And he's thinking, 
I'm, I'm being adopted by this, this prophet. Okay, what, what do I do now? And as he watches the prophet walk away, the, the realization of the magnitude of what he's being called to starts to come into his mind. So he chases after Elijah. He chases after him. That tells me this, that when we receive something, that when we reach out and we take our destiny, there's something that we do. There's something that we enact. Just like Jesus calling the disciples, he calls to them and they respond. Are you ready to respond to him this morning, today, tomorrow, and the next day, to wake up and respond to that call of Christ to say, come on, I am a father, I am am a son, or I am a daughter of the king. I'm ready to chase after everything you have for me, everything you have. In Corinthians, it says this, I'll be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord, the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. We are called to sonship in him. And it's not a servanthood. No longer do I call you servants for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all that I've heard from my father, I've made known, from you, I've made known to you. And because of this, it's like Elisha is ruined for anything else. That's it. The old life, the toil, the grit, the frustration, the hoping the harvest will come through, the early mornings, the heat from the sun, the sweat, the working on that cursed ground that goes all the way back into Genesis to make it produce something. That season's going to go and he's going to walk into a space a huge plain where there's a life of ease and blessing and fatherhood of God. He can't go back. Now I'm just going to slow it right down again because here's an amazing bit of the story. See, I love new stuff. I'm sorry, but I really do. And my phone contract was up um, a couple of weeks ago, and I was getting a lot of those phone calls, you know, when they want you to switch and switch and switch. And I quite liked having a long conversation with these people, trying to get the best possible deal. Um, And when they say they can't do it, I always say, well, let's not remember this. You called me. (laughs) You're on commission. I'm not. Come on. You can do better than that. Um, I'm sitting here at home with a cup of tea. I'm very comfortable. I imagine you're in an office trying to get the commission and trying to work hard. I'm going to make you work a little bit harder. I want that shiny new thing, please. Um, I'm sure there's grace for that. Um, so, my, so this new phone comes in the post. Um, and, then I, and I open it, and it's fantastic, and I play around with it. Um, and then about an hour later, I hear this shout from, from upstairs. Um, ben, you come here and look at this. Um, and it's my wife, Josie. So I go up, and, and, she, and she's standing there, and she's looking at... Um, well, she described it as it looked like a bear attack um, on a load of boxes. She said, who on earth has opened this? And because and and, and, and I've got hands like sausages, I don't really know how to open boxes. But just kind of tear through them. And I was so excited to get this shiny new thing. I kind of tore through it, and it all went everywhere. And then I've got this phone, and I'm playing with it. And my old phone is sitting here completely irrelevant, dead, gone. And sometimes, I know in my life, I can treat a new season like that. God brings a new thing, a new season, draws a new line, a new anointing, a new whatever, a new mantle, if you like, a new journey. And I'm so excited by it. I'm so up for it and ready for it that I forget the season I'm in. I I forget the things that I've got to do because I just want to move so fast to this shiny new thing. But Elisha, he doesn't act like that. This is a great bit of the story. He demonstrates three things, patience, honor, and compassion. And those are a hallmark of his life all the way through. And characteristics of Christ too. Think of it. His old life is over. This cloak has been put on him. He's going to be a prophet. Amazing. His chest puffs up. I think, I'm going to be, this, this, is, this is my destiny. You know, I'm sorry to say, if that was me, I'd be gone. I would run after Elijah and keep going. I'd leave the, the oxen. 
I'd leave all that stuff, the family, all that's gone. That's, that's an old life. I'd wash the, the, uh, the, the grit and the dirt off me and the toil. I, I'd lock it in a box of memories. I'd kick it down the road and I'd run as fast as I can for Elisha. He doesn't do that. The first thing he does is he wants to go and say goodbye to his parents. Honor your father and your mother. How amazing is that? He goes and says goodbye to them. The mom that brought him up, that carried him. The father that taught him about the farming. The mom that stayed up with him at night when he was poorly or couldn't sleep or was scared. The father that taught him things about how to be a man. The mother that taught him how to be compassionate. The family that were around him that worked together to produce the crops and the farm. He went back and he honoured them. He finished the season well. You know, how we start is as, if not more important, is as important as how we finish. I'm really conscious of that. And I'm speaking now from a place of trying to live that. I was given a, a new job. I prayed years ago for a particular role in a particular college and um, it happened uh, and I was due to leave my old job uh, which I've now left I've been at my new work for a week and it's fantastic I've been loving every minute of it um, and it's interesting because what uh, I found was I had to work a three-month notice period which is fine everything in me wanted to draw a line, and to start this new thing over here. But that's not how the kingdom works. And actually, that would be a huge dishonor to those people I'd work with. That would be a huge issue for people. I knew that I had to leave well, because why? I'm, this, I'm a son of the king. It's my job, my duty, to demonstrate how I want to leave things, to show people how it's done, to be Christ in that place. So I worked on my handover documents. I worked with my colleagues to get those things through. And I tried diligently. And I had to mentally not move in and shift into that new season just yet, but finish what I started. And I see echoes of that all through the word. I see it in Jesus' life. I see that Jesus who, rather than uh, during the resurrection story, when the stone has uh, been rolled away, that he didn't just get up and run out. He folded his clothes. The face cloth which had been on Jesus' head was not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. He finished his season well. In the same way, on the cross, when Jesus looks to the disciple and says, look after my mother. Mother, look after my son. He puts something in place. He finishes the season Wow, I have a lot to learn from that. The other thing is Elijah then goes and kills the oxen and he uses the tools of the trade, the yokes, and he burns them and he cooks the meat. He doesn't throw it away. He feeds the people, if you like, feeds the village. So this man who's moving into a new season, who won't see those people again, honors his father and mother is patient to get everything in place before he goes, and then leaves them with a full belly and a full heart. How amazing is that? He finishes his season well. And that's why I believe he was given a double portion, but we'll come to that. Now, there's lots of things that happen there, but I'm going to flick to when Elijah was taken and when Elisha uh, took the mantle. So there was 50 men from the company of the prophets. I'm reading from 2 Kings 2.7 here. Um, And they went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elijah had stopped at the Jordan. And Elijah, Elijah took his cloak, he rolled it up, he struck the water with it and the water divided to the right and to the left and two of them crossed over dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? And he says, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Oh my gosh, you've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, If you see me when I'm taken from you, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. 
Otherwise, it will, be, it will not. And as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot uh, of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father. There's that father-son relationship. The chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and he tore it in two. Elijah then picked up the cloak that had fallen from him. He went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left and he crossed over. Wow. Now in that story, Elijah isn't testing him. He's getting him to change his perspective. He's getting him to look up, to see things as heaven sees things, to invert everything, rather from earth up, from heaven down. That's why he wants him to see the chariots and the fire. And then he inherits this mantle. But Elijah doesn't sulk. Imagine this. This Elijah, who Elisha has stuck to like glue, and we know that because in the, in the verses and chapters before, they're pretty much inseparable. In fact, there's a bit of an altercation as they're heading towards the Jordan because Elijah is saying, uh, you stay here, I'm going to go on. And Elijah says, no way, I'm coming with you. I'm coming with you. It reminds me of when I come home sometimes from work and my youngest daughter, Ruby, she grips hold of my leg to the point where I can't feel it. And I have to lit, and I'm kind of walking like this. And she just won't let it go. Elijah was... Sorry, Elisha was holding on to the promise. He was holding on to the thing he was going to receive. Like the woman who pushes through the crowd and takes the hem of the garment and gets healed. If you are waiting on a promise, hold on. Stick to it like glue. It's coming. Like that prophet on the horizon when Elisha is there and toiling and working. It's coming and it's coming fast. It's pursuing you. You're not pursuing it. It's pursuing you. Let me inherit a double portion. Let me inherit a double portion. Let me get that heavenly perspective. And this is a a lesson of faith that stayed with Elisha through his whole ministry. That faith of being sure of what you hope for, but certain of what you do not see. What's the first thing he does? He doesn't sulk. He doesn't get upset that his father, the person that he's learned from, that he's stuck to all, these ta- all this time, has gone. He takes the, this promise and he activates it. He goes to the Jordan. He strikes the Jordan and the water parts. He gets straight on board. Isn't that amazing? That suddenly there's a third shift for a season for him. He's been a worker. He's been somebody who's worked in the fields. He's then, if you like, been a son or an apprentice where he's watched, he's learned, he's listened, and he's served. And now that season has changed and it's time for him to take his place as one of the prophets. And he understands the seasons. He's finished each one well, but he's ready. Now, from a human point of view, I look for that. I think, I wonder how I'd feel. I wonder if I would activate that. I wonder if I would cling hold of that, that, that mantle and that coat and cry and be upset that something's been taken from me. But he knew the season he was in. He knew the time he was in. And as a people and as a church, we're called, like the people of Issachar, to know the times of which we're living and we're born. It is for such a time as this. Whatever's in your hand, whatever gift God has given you, whatever the generations have passed down to you whatever Christ has for you take it and activate it and use it you know in the Old Testament we find stories like people defeating a whole army with a with a with a jawbone of an ox whatever's in your hand use it God will anoint it you know anointing is oil it's something that makes the gears move quicker it's something that protects you warriors would put oil on their shields so the arrows would fly off And that's what the anointing does. Whatever you have, when God adds his anointing to it, my gosh, it moves fast. Like the gears in a Ferrari. 
Bang. He might not have felt like it, but he activated it anyway. Prophets, I don't think the prophets liked it. Because they then said, well, look, we think Elijah has been taken up in a whirlwind. We'll go and find him. And he said, no, 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 don't. And they kept pestering and pestering, okay, go and find him. They didn't accept him, but they didn't need to accept him. Because he was assured in who he was, who he stood, because he was chosen. Because he burnt the tools of his past already. He'd finished his seasons well, and he was ready for the next one. And then we go on. I've only got a few minutes left. I'm going to try and get this in. But then we go on, and and I can read about 16 miracles, which is about double what Elijah did. He did receive a double portion. He did do double the amount of works, but there were different works. When you look at them, they were filled with compassion, like lying on top of a boy to bring him back to life, like the, the woman whose oil never ran out. They were all based around compassion and hope. He had a servant called Gizi, or Geza, Gehazi. Gehazi, let's go with that. Um, And Gehazi was interesting to say the least. You'll find Gehazi in 2 Kings 6.8. Elisha prays for this king, and this king gets healed. Um, And the king wants to give him stuff, wants to give him money, wants to give him land, wants to give him title, whatever. He wants to say, not just, this wasn't about thank you. He kind of wants to buy the promises of God. They are not to be bought. They are free because they cost Christ everything. And he refuses. And what happens is, Gehazi goes after this king and says, look, okay, Elisha's not going to charge you anything, but give the money to me. And he takes it. And Elisha is furious. And why is he furious? Because he's left that land of toil and frustration and hardship uh, with the land in his old life. He's cut that off. He's now living in the grace and ease of God. He's now listening to the Lord and responding. He's now got this father-son relationship. It's not to be bought. It's not a trade deal. And he's really frustrated. And this tells me about the character of this Ghazi. I'm going to finish in a moment. But I'm going to tell you a quick story first, which, is, which I love. Um, after uh, th- th- there's a frustration, there is... Um, uh, now, the king of Aram was at war. This is in, in, uh, in Kings... He was at war with Israel. Now, you might not know much about the king of Aram, but what I can tell you is that he wasn't meant to be there. Hadeazar is what he was called. Now, remember back right when I started and I talked about anointing the two kings? Hazel was the person that was meant to be anointed to take over from Hadeazar. He was a king out of season. He was a king that was going to war with Israel and he was out of season. He was out of time. He was out of resource, he was out of luck, he was out of season, and he was out of the will. Now, why am I telling you that? Because the things that we face, the challenges that we face, be that debts, be that sickness, be that frustrations, be that anxiety, be that worry, challenges, whatever, I want you to know they're in the wrong season. They're out of season. They have no right to be there. When you know the season you're in, it allows you to overcome those things. That king was out of season. He shouldn't have been on the throne. He shouldn't have been going to war. So after conferring with the officers, the king of Aram said, I'll set up camp in in this place. I'll go and take them out. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Armenians are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on that place, indicated by the man of God. Time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me which of you is on the side of the king of Israel? So he keeps telling him constantly and constantly. None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha the prophet, 
who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. He's a prophetic man. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he's in Dolphin. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there, and they went by night and surrounded the city. They went by night. That night, a quiet place, a place of darkness, that time when you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and your mind is, is whirring, a time where the enemy and things creep in, that's when he sent it. But I'll tell you this, the joy comes in the morning. When the servant of the man got up, that's Gezar, and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And here's what the prophet says, don't be afraid. For those who are with us are much more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Think right back to when Elijah was taken and he saw a chariot and a couple of horses. His faith has been building over time. Faith is that muscle. And now, when he looks up, he sees the whole host of heaven's armies around him. He's not panicking. He's not worried. He knows God is in control. What a man of faith. Because he's finished the seasons well. He's started them well. He's taken the risks. He's left things that should have been left. He's taken up that which should have been taken. We haven't got time now, but have a look at the story of Solomon and Solomon's downfall starts when he starts to import horses from Egypt, the very thing that God drowned. Those things in Egypt that God cut off from Moses and left behind, Solomon brought back. In other words, that which God has separated from you and put over there and said, that's your old life, I've cut it off. Don't bring it back. He gets him to look up, look at the hills, Look at the potential and he sees the army of the Lord and then he blinds the army and he goes up to him and he says, these are not, (laughs) this is not the road and this is not the city. It reminds me of that Star Wars. These are not the droids you're looking for. And and they agree. So they follow Elisha and he leads them right to the king of Egypt, uh, right to the king, back to the king of Israel. I was going to read through this but I won't now. So, I'll just, I'll just try and bring this to a close. What I find fascinating is Elisha is a very different kind of prophet. You'd think that he'd call down fire on them. That sounds familiar from Elijah on Mount Carmel. He doesn't. He goes to the king with this army, this blinded army, and they set a feast before them. He sets a feast in the presence of my enemies. He feeds them. He loves on them. He changes the the politics of the time. They go from this warring faction to peace. And there's 80 years of peace. Whereas in Elijah's time, there's 80 years of war. We're called to bring peace. We're called to think differently. We're called to forgive It's God's place to bring judgment. It's our place to live in grace and forgiveness. Amen. Absolutely. That is powerful. Elijah is demonstrating that a new order of things, a complete and utter overflowing grace and provision for his enemy, which led to peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. His name means to rescue, to deliver, and to liberate. And that's what he did. You look up and there's hundreds of men and chariots and horses trained in battle, ready to go, probably from infancy. They would have been in the academies learning to fight. That's all they did. And here's a prophet, an ex-farmer, a person chosen by God who looks up and he sees heaven's army outnumbering them, outgunning them. He knows that arm is out of season. He knows what's with him is more powerful. 
And I'm going to finish now with this. It's early in the morning. The servant's there, and he has to go and wake Elisha up. Doesn't that remind you of something? That reminds me of Jesus in the boat. (laughs) Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping and the disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, gosh, save us. We're going to drown. And he replied, well, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and he rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. There was no sweat. There was no toil. There was no grit. There was just grace and rest. Why? Because Elisha had left the toil and the sweat and the grit in his old life. He was done with getting the cattle to bend to his will. He'd left the fire behind him. He'd let go. He'd looked up. He'd seen that heavenly perspective. And my prayer is that in our daily lives, we see that heavenly perspective. Nothing is wasted. Every experience, everything that we walk through in our lives. Christ has been there before us and nothing is wasted. Jesus has woken up and calmed the storm, but I believe if he wasn't woken up, he would have slept through it. There's power in him standing up and calming the storm, but there's also power in us being able to navigate through it. Sometimes knowing the season you're in is knowing when to calm that storm and knowing when God's called us to navigating through it, to navigate through it. When I was uh, in the youth, um, and like Elisha, turned his right, I'm a bit like Elisha because I'm bold, like he was. Um, when I was in youth, I remember somebody saying, God will do all that he can do in order for you to live. But God won't do all that you can do in order for you to grow. And my prayer for us today is that, Lord God, Give us the unquenchable, uncompromising faith to know the season we're in, to know when to navigate through the storm, when to calm the storm. Lord, help us finish well and start the season well. Help us to take what's in our hands and to activate what you've given us. Lord, we're hungry and we're ready. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.